It's recording. Oh, I didn't even get to ask. (laughs) (laughs) It's all right. Here we are on The Blind Man in Black. I am your host, Brian Snyder. If uh, you like the show, please like it, review, rate it, do whatever you have to. If you don't like it, thumb down it or whatever they do, uh, put a bad review, whatever you need to do, just just say something about it. Um, I'm very excited because I am here with Leisha Shapiro. Uh, She's a former actor, musician, uh, currently a psychotherapist, a licensed psychotherapist, an LGBTQ advocate, an animal advocate. Thank you so much for being here, welcome. Thank you so much, Brian, for having me, inviting me. It's been many years since we've communicated. This is great. I'm happy. Yeah, to I, I, I thought about it, and I think it's been 23 years. Right. So I'm 42 years old now. So, I mean, gosh, we really were kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I should start out by saying, so Lisa and I went to CalArts together, and I think you were only there for the first year from like from like ni- 1997 into 1998 right actually no i was in the theater department from 97 to 98 and then i i went to the music department at cal arts for a year so i was there for two full years i just annoyed fran drescher to the, or whatever her name was fran not drescher i was trying to make a bad <laughs> fran bennett fran bennett yeah. Yes, I had annoyed, irritated her enough and broken enough rules on campus that they were kind of like, look, we think you're great, but you can't be in our department anymore. See, that I didn't know anything about that, but we, I, I want to get into that because it's important because my memory, I, I, I remember us having, you and I having very in, like in, intense conversations, and I remember thinking wild. That's that's like my memory is is a wildness about you. But you also had this very sweet, compassionate, loving, um, just kind of energy that was so intense is the other word. You were so intense and talented and and, and, in in a multiplicity of ways. And so I want to explore all that, but I want to get to the root of it. Like, what is the genesis of Lisa? Oh, well, I think that ever, ever, ever changing, ever evolving. Um, I, at this stage of my life, am most proud of the fact that I have learned to be at peace. Can, can you life. get a little closer to the microphone or? Um, sure. Is, is yeah. this better? Yeah? Is, yeah, is yeah. Better? Okay. It's better. Um, I don't actually have a microphone, so I, I'm on a, I'm on a dinky Chromebook that I use for work, but it is connected to some pretty decent speakers, so hopefully that will help. Yeah, yeah, you just sound great right now, so that's good. Okay, um, so yeah, I, Genesis, I, you know, wild, um, talented, pretty much could do whatever it was I decided I would wanted to do. Uh, was what I accomplished pretty well in my life, but I was never still. Like, you know, even when things were fantastic, I was like, "What's next? This there's something missing." And in recent years, I have come to a, a place where I just enjoy my own company very much. Mm-hmm. And I, there's a stillness, uh, you know, coming home, plants, enjoying a beer after work. My work, uh, my work is extremely rewarding. Um, I have great relationships with my family. I, I have, you know, I'm seeing a woman that I like very much. And all of these things have fallen into place when I got to where I didn't need any of them anymore. Where it was like, oh, I have arrived. Uh, what if this is as good as it gets? You need to be okay with it if this is as good as it gets. And then things just got better. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I grew up in a family. There was mental illness. Um, there, there Did you were, grow up? I grew up in Brooklyn um, in Section 8 housing because, uh, you know, immigrant family came here legally vetted through from Russia through the United Jewish Federation because they couldn't be practicing Jewish people in Russia at that time. It was the height of communism in 1975. Rations, lines for bread, you know, outhouses, um, sleeping in one room. And my mother, my aunt, and my grandparents, and my cousin Boris, who you have probably met at CalArts once or twice because he came up to see uh, he came up to see our shows. 
Uh, so he really? introduced you. Did he go yeah. to Awa? He did. Yes. Wow, okay. Yes, he did. And I still remember the feedback he gave me uh, for that for that character. He said mm -hmm. you were you were so great until you had to get upset. And then when you got upset, you were Lisa. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was excellent feedback. Um, but so yeah, so we I was the first born in this in this country. Um, I was born in San Francisco. Uh, my mom met my dad in Florida, of all places, which is where I am now. Mm -hmm. uh, but they met, and then my father's family moved to San Francisco. My mother went with them, had me. Uh, they separated, and she moved with me to Brooklyn. And she went about making money to raise a kid, pretty much as a single parent. So my grandparents raised me mm -hmm. while she worked. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, my grandmother was very, very passionate matriarch of the family. She was she was the one that dragged them out of Russia. She was the one that was like, we need to work so that these kids can do better than we did. Very classic, quintessential immigrant story. Um, and uh, she was nuts. So I went I saw every opera every theater production, we had no money. I, you know, ate with food stamps. My grandpa was a cab driver, car service, and my grandmother cleaned houses. And my mom worked in a butcher shop. But uh, I always had leather shoes on my feet because, you know, you, can, you have to have that. And right. I was always in bed. And I was made fun of quite a bit because kids at school were eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I was eating pumpernickel bread with salmon. <laughs> so, <laughs> which it, it sounds good to me it's delicious but not when you're in second grade and you barely speak english having been born in this country right so it very the cultural divide i was being raised by people in their 50s mm -hmm. who had just come to this country and were trying to make ends meet um but my grandmother actually as amazing and remarkable as she was did suffer from mental illness and it ran in her family. So there was, it was colorful. Colorful is a really mild and pleasant way of describing my early childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, there was volatility. There were explosive moments. Uh, my grandparents divorced after 55 years of marriage because of how explosive their relationship was. Wow. 55 uh, years? Yep. And the truth is, is they, they became better, much better friends and communicated with each other significantly better when they lived apart really um, like, after like, all that time they decided to end it that's amazing well i think it was my mom and my aunt pretty much thought that they would wind up just you know causing a heart attack for each other or a stroke because right. like the fighting was so intense and it never got better it never there was just so much of it so my flair for drama if you must know <laughs> but it, it, it came from that. But also I had, you know, we had a piano in the house and music was something that I seemed to have a natural ability for Boris as well. And Boris wound up, you know, becoming a film composer and won a couple of Emmy Awards. And really? now, now he's a professor. Uh, he teaches uh, he teaches very, very high IQ kids, things like Sartre and Aristotle. So because Hollywood, he burned out on Hollywood. Um, wow. And he still, you know, he still writes music here and there, but yep. Any so movies music, that we would know? Uh, if Dog Rabbit was a movie he did, Prague Duet was a movie he did, but the awards that he got were actually for like world figure skating championships. And okay. he got into writing for sports, which is not at all what he wanted. He wanted mm -hmm. to, uh, he wanted, he wanted the, I, there's a monopoly now. I mean, it's, it's Hans Zimmer and it's John Williams and yeah. Elfman. And, and it's still those those three or four composers like they're still all around and you, you can't compete with those guys. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, I th and I actually think that the difference between he and I and I hope he forgives me if he ever watches this <laughs> is that we were both very much told you need to be the best at whatever it is you do. Like you need to be the award winner. You need to if you're going to get an award, it better be an Academy Award because the others just don't count. Right. I maybe listened to that somewhere a little. Mm -hmm. um, he took it to heart and it, I think really it manifested in a deep frustration and failure to acknowledge how successful he's got three Emmy awards sitting on his mantle and they kind of don't mean anything to him. Yeah. So uh, I think I, I 
kind of got away a little bit easier than that from the influence of our family. Um, so by the time I was 16, like my, my life in Brooklyn was very interesting. Before, before you go back, I, I want to, I mean, before you go on, excuse me, I yeah. want to get into the mental illness. Now, I, I mean, looking back on it and being, uh, you know, a psychotherapist, are you able to diagnose what your grandmother? Uh, yeah. Yes. My grandmother had, um, may she rest in peace. She died a few years ago. Um, and I miss her very much, but she had borderline personality disorder. Uh, which, so you were either on a pedestal or like the worst ever. Right. But moreover, um, she did this, this atrocious thing where when I didn't cooperate and of the four kids that she raised, she raised my mother, my aunt, Boris, and myself, they referred to me as World War III because I fought every step of the way and everyone else was more or less docile. So mm -hmm. she, she could mold them the way that she wanted and I resisted just naturally and inherently. Mm -hmm. um, so- What's that about? My fantastically brilliant personality, I think. <laughs> I agree. So, yeah, I think I, it was just personality that saved me. I, I knew what I liked and what I didn't like. And I didn't, you know, the don't talk back or you're, you'll do this because I said so. That just, that didn't work for me. I, mm -hmm. I needed to have a reason and I don't like that. I'm not going to eat it. I don't mm -hmm. like that. I'm not going to wear it. Um, yeah. I would rip it like on my body if you tried to put it on me. Mm -hmm. So for a person that is mentally unwell and there's always... Um, a couple of overlapping symptomologies of narcissism with borderlines. Mm -hmm. There's an entitlement. There's a, I know better. Um, you will do as I say, or there will be major consequences. Mm -hmm. uh, there were, there were major consequences. I like would get under the bed and she would take a broomstick and try and prod me out from mm -hmm. under the bed. It, it was. It, and how old are you? Like five or five, seven, yeah. nine. Uh, it continued till I was 16, mm -hmm. but also the, the scariest thing she did, kind of the most damaging thing she did that I, then I required therapy for in my thirties, mind you, like mm -hmm. however many years later I required therapy for was that she, it would escalate to where I wouldn't give in and she would be um, very wound up. And then she would say, oh, my heart. And she would put her hands over her heart and she would say, where's the nitroglycerin? And I know exactly what those pills look like and smell like, but it would basically be that I was inducing a heart attack. Like mm -hmm. and I believed it. Um, and so then she would leave the house and I wouldn't know where she went. And I thought that she would leave the house and die somewhere. And it would be my fault. Like that terrorism went on for a very long time. That's horrible. Yeah. And, you know, one of my really great friends who I've been friends with, she goes, but why did you keep believing her? Mm -hmm. And it was such a logical question. She's like, she always came back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was floored by the question. I was like, yeah, that's such a logical question. Why, do, why did I keep believing her? But when you think about it, she actually was an older woman. She actually had a prescription for nitroglycerin. Mm -hmm. um, and the fear, the terror that I you know, she's, I would go onto the rooftops of our, of our buildings. I lived in the projects uh, right off of Coney Island. So if you've ever been to Brooklyn, like where you see the boardwalk and the cyclone, that was where, you know, I had my first kiss under that boardwalk. Um, oh, so it was wow. a very magical place to grow up. And I, you know, I went to school in Manhattan by the time I got to high school. Mm -hmm. So uh, our buildings were 26 or 28 floors high. And I would go on the roofs of all the, all of them looking for her. And I would like stand over the edge of the roof and look down from all four corners of these rooftops, wondering if she had flung herself off of the roof because I wouldn't eat the soup or whatever it was. Yeah. The power struggles were over very, very trivial things. And I brought, I brought that with me um, into my own relationships and for years. So did she triangulate like other family members like to oh, play? Yeah. Good use of a clinical word, Brian. Yes, she did. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, she did triangulate and there was a lot of splitting. And I, you know, Boris was actually, by the time he was an adolescent and was seeing that this was such a horribly unstable environment for me to be living in, his mom made different choices than my mom did. And his mom married a great guy who adopted him. And by the time he was 11, they moved away from my grandmother and they moved to Florida and they left me behind. So my mom was living her life with her very bad choices. I never did live with her, uh, although she lived very close by. And it was just understood that my grandmother and my grandfather were my primary caretakers. Mm -hmm. So by the time I was 13, 14, I started kind of giving them a run for their money for lack of a better word, because now I was, you know, I had gotten into the performing arts high school and I was having to get on the train and travel from Coney Island all the way up to Lincoln Center every day. That was almost an hour train commute and the freedom, it was so liberating. I was out from under her lens and watch. She went through every pocket, every backpack pocket, every jacket pocket, every pants pocket, my socks. Um, and she did that before I gave her reasons to. So naturally I then gave her reasons to. Um, mm -hmm. But he stopped, he was, he's kind of said, wait, she can't stay there anymore. You guys like she, you know, Babushka is nuts. She, she can't stay there anymore. Yeah. Um, and they still kind of didn't, didn't change anything up until, until in high school, I, you know, I discovered pot in, in Central Park and I started skipping classes and friends and um, I got extremely rebellious to the point where I was just like, okay, I'm not going to come home. And I did take <laughs> off. I ran away from home a couple of times. They found me. Now, do and you, do you feel like it was that constant, like, uh, just micro power, helicopter? Power yeah. yeah. That was caused the, the, the desire to rebel. I think that that certainly, um, that certainly exacerbated a naturally occurring desire to rebel mm -hmm. because genetically I was the only one that she had micromanaged everyone the same way. Mm -hmm. I was the only one that resisted as much as I did. And I think that was the introduction of my father's genetics. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, the genetics made all the difference in the world um, for me. So I was already naturally in, inclined to break a rule because I just, for the sake of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> I sometimes still want to, and I, I don't anymore because I recognize that that's just an, a silly old habit. You don't actually have to break any rules now. Yeah. Um, but it's still an inherent like, Ooh, can I, can I cross this barrier? What would happen if I did? Um, and it makes, it makes me an extremely effective therapist. I work with adolescents. I work with mm -hmm. kids on the spectrum. And so I can already like sense when they're about to try and, you know, pull some stunt. And I just, I kind of will look at them and I'm like, mm, you're about to lie. And they're like, how do you know? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're about to lie. So don't just tell me the truth. And then we'll figure out a way to, to, to convey the message to your parents without it being a lie. So you can see the tells. Yes. I can smell the tells. So what, what can you describe what that would be just to get a sense of how you can kind of uh, analyze that? Well, there's a shift in body language. Um, okay. They'll uh, look away. Um, they'll generally, and this is FBI, a little bit of FBI information, but they, like you're more inclined to, I think it is look left if you're about hesitating before you answer. But I've learned, I've learned to see, you know, how a kid sits when they're completely relaxed, what their body language looks like. And then there's, there could be the minutest of changes in the positioning of the neck that alerts me to uh, uh, there's, something's going to be different with whatever comes out of his mouth next. Um, it, it's really, and it's also a, a change in the energy around a child or an mm -hmm. adult for that matter. Um, adults don't take to it as easily when you say to them, I, I sense that you might be being dishonest. <laughs> They'll be, they get more defensive. So I, I have to phrase that a little bit differently, which is, oh, are you trying to convince yourself or me right. in a situation like that? But that's, that's just very careful phrasing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, 
uh, to answer your question, I think that that it exacerbated a naturally occurring. My father, my father was raised. I didn't know him at all. Mm -hmm. but I understand that I resemble him very much physically, like physiologically. I have his face and his eye color and his leg shape based on photographs and stuff that I've seen. But he if, was. If I remember, you have very bright blue eyes, right? I do. I do. Right. Very bright blue eyes, curly hair, and, and intense. I remember those eyes were; they had a very mischievous kind of, but empathetic. Uh, uh, there was an empathy in there, but there was also a mischievousness as well. Yes, yes, and I think that those are both probably still still true. I had to work on my gaze in graduate school when we were doing practicum and seeing patients. It was sort of like a fishbowl experience because the whole class would be watching um and they I, you know the feedback i got back all the time was you're gonna scare the shit out of the patient if that's how you look at them <laughs> so, like your clinical skills are on point but you have to work on that gaze um because it is very empathetic and when a patient is suffering or having a hard time they can sense my empathy and they say it God, I can tell that you're feeling what I'm feeling. And I, I appreciate that so much. I hear that a lot. Like, God, I, you know, the look on your face is showing me how I feel. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of great. And I, I suppose it was effective for the world of acting um, very much. Yeah. Yeah. You, you were uh, phenomenal. I, I, and, and that's the thing is I, but we'll get into Cal arts and all that shit later, but um I, that's what I remember. It was this, this, this very like raw, intense talent. And, um, and you know, like you, I, 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 I remember you, but you left and there were others that left, but, but you, I, I, I like, I felt like you were always there. I felt like you were there throughout all four years at CalArts. You were always like present with us, but I, I know you weren't, but I felt like you, you, you should have been there. Thank you so much for saying that. I just got the feels in a very big way. I mean, I'm, I'm still friends with Wit and Aaron, uh, right. Sarah Wilson. Uh, the fact that, you know, I see what happened you, the fact that, that I have a connection and I know what your wife looks like. She's lovely, by the way. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, this, that's not common for having met people for one year of my life, one and a half years of my life. Well, I, I talk about this with like Sarah and everybody in, in our acting class, you know, that was a, an intense experience that brought us together like a family. And I mean, we were sharing, tra you know, trauma and, and the things that we had been through. So um, it was it was it brought us together in, in a way that I, I, I think wouldn't have happened in another type of academic environment. I agree. It's trauma bonding. Almost. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the work that we were doing and Craig, bless him, introducing us to the work that we did because, um, Wit and I did that scene. God, I don't know how, why, well, of course we're going to veer to Cal arts because it, it, it's our personal shared experience, but, um, Spring's awakening that scene where, you know, where he had to beat me with a stick till he killed me that, that scene, we worked on that scene, the padding of, you know, my backside the devastation he experienced at having to hit me legitimately hit me because that was how it was being directed it was like no we're not faking this right and we cushioned we learned how to get what what was necessary for the impact and the sound of the beating to, to be as real as possible and I, I, I will probably never ever forget the silence at the end of that scene people did not break silence for probably a minute yeah um, so the, the material we were doing was so raw and we were all so raw and so alive and talented. Like that whole group was extremely talented. So, and multifaceted and had something singular to bring to the table. So yeah. my little cat, we had discussed this. I have a little white cat. Her name is Bella. She is a rescue. She just crawled across the screen and is playing with a, a branch. So I'm going to put her on the ground now. But she, is, she can um, stay there. That's fine if, if if she's comfortable. Well, she's she's a sweet little thing, but she's mis very mischievous. So we're gonna put her down. She may make her way back up. I just don't want her to turn off the computer by accident. Okay. Because that, that has happened. But thank you, Bella. Brian just invited you to stay. 
<laughs> so yeah. So let's go back. I, I, I want to, before we move on, I want to understand a little bit about your grandmother. What, what do you feel like having lived with somebody with borderline personality disorder, what did you have to carry? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because my wife uh, had an intense experience with somebody that had borderline personality. And the analogy that she kind of got through it is like, you know, carrying rocks and somebody with borderline personality, they want to hand you their trauma, their trauma, which are the rocks basically. And she was advised not to hold on to them because that's what the person was going to do. So what did, did you, are you still carrying your grandmother's rocks? If that makes sense. Um, I will probably carry a pebble forever. Right. Uh, I took many years. Um, I had post-traumatic stress. Uh, mm -hmm. It was never diagnosed by a professional person. Um, I recognized it when I kept dating a person that was pretty much the same person in a different body over and over and over again. And they were generally my grandmother. They were some mm -hmm. interpretation of my grandmother where everything was about them and everything was about not how not to disappoint them. And I enabled it. Um, clearly I was, I was inviting it into my life somehow. Um, but it also created situations of familiarity with a lot of conflict, explosive conflict. So I was finding people that I could continue that behavior with. Even though I ran from them and I ran from her and um, I did all sorts of very dangerous things to get away from her and to get away from New York and I succeeded. But I, you know, as an adult um, that, you know, had kind of cleared away the fear of, oh, substance abuse or that I was going to be some sort of like in big trouble with the law because those were genuine concerns in my teenage years. Um, I just, you know, kept even after my master's degree and I went to Columbia and I graduated from Columbia, which people in my family were like, good job. Yeah, that that's was a what great school. But they were just, you know, it was very unexpected, like really. And they knew I was bright, but nobody ever thought I'd have the discipline. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my big, that was my biggest fuck you, actually, uh, mm -hmm. was, was going there, getting in there and going there and finishing. Yeah. So now you could just put that in your pipe and smoke it and you can call me whatever you want and tell me whatever you want. Uh, there was a very big problem with me being gay for years and years and years. When did you come out? So I came out when I was after, after CalArts and I, when I left CalArts, I left CalArts cause I had teetered into some dark territory there. Um, I, I had made some, some silly choices about how to make extra money on the side and I don't want to incriminate myself any further. Okay. But I believe that's suggestive enough for you to come up with, you know, multiple explanations as to what I could have been getting my hands into. But um, I have a very vivid imagination, so I'm going to go to the extreme with that. Go ahead. Go to, go to the extreme with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you probably won't be too terribly far off, but oh, I asked. Go ahead. I was going to tell you just just to make you feel at ease. I, I worked in the porn industry. Um, I was not a performer, but I, I, uh, I, 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 when I was losing my eyesight, I got, after I, I finished my master's degree at UCLA, um, I had went through a shift in my, my vision loss and I got scared and I'm like, I need to make some fucking money. And I, 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 I it will take too long in the mainstream. So I, I thought, okay, what can I do? I have a, you know, acting, um, degree and, uh, now I have a master's in directing, um, what makes sense to do it fast and quick and dirty is porn. And sure. so I ended up, um, I ended up writing pirates for digital playground under the pseudonym Max Massimo. And then I wrote pirates too, but I also was a project wow. manager for the company. And that's uh, awesome, actually, if what's you're that? I said, that's pretty awesome. Actually, if you're going to do it, you may as well like really do it. Yeah, I did it. I did it. <laughs> So, so I just want to let you know, you can say anything you want. I mean, so, that's yeah, no, no judgment. It was just, there was a really good opportunity at CalArts, you know, between the art openings and all of the 
uh, dubious amounts of alcohol and pot that were already on campus. I just, I just found a, an opportunity to bring a substance onto campus that wasn't already there. Mm -hmm. and, and I kept it very, very quiet. You, I guess you didn't hear about it or maybe you did and you didn't. No, no, yeah. absolutely not. I mean, I think I would have heard about it because that, uh, yeah, I mean, that kind of, actually... that kind of thing would have spread very quickly. Um, um, because yeah. there were, there was, yeah. a another, uh, student that was a stripper. I, I knew about that and I didn't know her at all. And right. so that went around fast, but I, I did not hear about what, whatever you did. So, no, no, I, I kept it, it was, and I did make some money. Um, mm -hmm. I made some pretty good money, but I also could see myself slipping deeper and darker into a place that was going to have nothing to do with the theater world or the music world or the college world. Because I was extremely good at it, mm -hmm. uh, would not have been able to catch me. Um, and I, I remember kind of having a, a confessional conversation with my mother, who was on a plane to Los Angeles like the next day. And she came, and I was in the music department at Cal Arts. It was our sophomore year because I had done freshman year, and the theater department kindly asked me. They were like, "We're not going to ask you to leave the school, but we." We think you're too disruptive of a force for the department. See, I don't, I don't recall that. Let's so let's start back. What I, I remember, I, I just remember you being full of life. You, you were, uh, you know, just you, you had this intense like presence. That's the thing. This you had this beautiful intense presence, and then, uh, but I don't remember there being any issues at, at all, like being disruptive or any of that. So. When did that all start? Well, you know, I think it started very close to the beginning. I think that Fran Bennett, I kind of tricked her into letting me into this into the program. It, it truth be told, um, I, I harassed. I found out that she was the person that I would need to speak with to get an audition way after auditions had been closed. Okay. Way after, way after you know, this classes had been selected. Um, but did I you had, seduce Fran? No, I just, I came in and I told her I was going to, maybe I did intellectually seduce Fran. See, I think your eyes probably, that's, that, there was a seductiveness in those eyes. I, I remember that. Thank you. But it was, it was tricksy of me what I did because I didn't expect her to, I left, I must have left 10 or 12 messages saying, I really, really need to get into your program. Please give me a call back. At least let me know if you can make an exception. I know auditions are closed. You would think that I had a couple of monologues prepared for this moment. I didn't because I didn't half expect to hear back from her. And then I did. And she said to me, you are the most tenacious, annoying person that has ever left all of these voicemails. You should just come to the come to come tomorrow. And I was totally, <laughs> totally unprepared for this audition. OK, so I told her I was doing Uncle Vanya in Russian. So that way you could cover it up because she had no idea what, what you were saying. saying. Right. So I chose a scene. I got the vibe of the scene, the feeling of the scene. Um, there was no way I was going to memorize the scene. Um, and I just went ahead and did, and did I improv in Russian. Was it, was it about Uncle Vanya? Yes. Was it actually Chekhov? No. <laughs> so... <laughs> So she, she admitted me and put me in your class. And it was like maybe two weeks before school started. That's amazing. I did not know that. No, well, nobody knows. I nobody, she said, don't, you can't tell anyone this. So wait a minute. So was this the only time you had done this? Was CalArts like your, where you wanted to go? And, and, and how did, I mean. Yeah, you... I had gone to the performing arts high school um, which was where I finally got some liberation from my grandmother and from Brooklyn and from the control. And there I, you know, I was, it was Manhattan and friends were partying and the limelight and the palladium were very popular clubs. Um, and teenagers were getting fake IDs and going out and partying. And, and I, I was participating in that kind of thing, which was completely unacceptable to my grandparents and to mm -hmm. my mother. 
So I didn't come home one night and I was out after being out clubbing and I was still wearing my club dress and I was with the makeup and the go-go boots because it was a 70s night. Mm -hmm. And I was at that time, I had a boyfriend who was too old for me. So I was 16 and he was maybe 25. Okay. And we were sitting on a park bench just talking. And my mother, my mother showed up. My mother's had this uncanny way of finding me uh, throughout mm. my life. Like right when I'm about to teeter into a dangerous place, I have to give her credit there. Um, and she just took one look at me and we had partied pretty hard the night before. And I'm sure it was evident on my face, my 16 year old face with, you know, makeup dripping down my cheeks. She freaked out. And she said, yeah, this is, we can't do this anymore. And I said, well, I'm not going back to your mother's house if that's what you think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to live with you either. So she goes, well, we have to, can you, you got to come home with me today and we'll decide what we're going to do. And I was in the music department at the uh, performing arts high school. I was in the choir department and I was in, I played the piano there. Um, and I really, really wanted to get into the theater department, but their auditions had been closed off for, they were so highly competitive that they didn't even give people an opportunity to audition. So when I went to audition, I got into the music department and that's always kind of been the way until Cal Arts. So Cal Arts was my first ever theater mm -hmm. training of any kind. Um, that's, that's amazing. I just had, I know, I think I did a production of Will Abner in elementary school where I played the mayor. Um, that was about it. No acting training, no technique, nothing. I, I really didn't know anything about anything when it came to the theater. Well, you knew how to get into the theater school. I did. I did know that. And I, by then I had, you know, started to learn about monologues and read up and, and, you know, I didn't want to, you fake it till you make it, which is still a philosophy of mine. Um, that mm. I fortunately haven't had to use in a very long time, but if I did, I would. <laughs> <laughs> like Shakespeare, doesn't he say lies like truth? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, um, so that was my introduction to the world of theater. And I think that Fran saw how green inexperienced and duped she was and she sort of gave me a very hard time for the rest of that that whole year like she just put me on her shit list and i stayed there that's now, so odd i like I, I like out of everybody there were you know there were some people that you know they had varying levels of talent and i felt like you were amongst the most talented and it's so odd that she would have uh, had any it, issue it with you very, it was very personal for her it was like she understood that i didn't have any discipline you got to remember i didn't always show up for tai chi okay uh, i got into trouble with uh somebody in the dorms like it was after one of the art openings and some dorm guy said you can't smoke here and i told him to shove it up his ass mm -hmm filed a formal complaint to the theater department and okay. they got me, they got it so that I couldn't go into the dorms, which made it very challenging because I was dating wit. Okay. And he snuck me in all the time. And they knew, they knew that I was sneaking in against the rules. And I think they just started to collect little things like that little point, little, okay, she got this. She didn't show up for this. And she, she didn't this and Craig just thought it was the funniest thing ever. And, uh, you know, he talked to me repeatedly. Don't change a thing. You're perfect. Yeah. Everything you're doing is perfect. But ultimately he was a visiting teacher. He wasn't, if he, if, if I think that, if, you know, I don't know. However it worked out was we're not expelling you from the school. You haven't committed any heinous offense, but we think you would do better in the music department. Did they really say that? So like the theater department said you would do better in the music department? Basically. Really? And if you'd like to stay in the school, well, I had developed a little bit of a reputation as a piano player and I was wanted in the music department. They wanted good piano players in the music department. Yeah, I remember your piano uh, was beautiful. You, you played mostly classical, right? And how, how did you learn how to play the piano? 
that was a that was a kind of a requirement of being a child to Russian family. Mm -hmm. um, it's the standard thing, like you're dirt poor and you live off of welfare, which we did until we didn't. Um, but there was always a piano at home. Piano lessons were mandatory. I would spend all of Saturday at the Manhattan. It wasn't the Manhattan School of Music. It was the Manus College of Music. They're very similar. They were competitive, actually. Just one of them was a little better known than the other. Um, and uh, it wasn't, it just wasn't, it, it wasn't optional. Learning to play the piano wasn't optional. And I resented and hated it um, because I had to do it. And I, it came naturally to me. I was good at it. So then that just reinforced why I had to do it because you're so good at it. So how could you not do it? And then I started using it to get into schools. <laughs> right. And, and I did, I, I, I managed to get into, I even got into NYU with, with a piano faculty um, after CalArts, which I never, I never went. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to prove that I could. I had zero interest at, at all in pursuing a, batch, a BFA in music. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of rude and disrespectful to all the, the professors that really were encouraging me and wanting me to do it. It was such a solo thing. It's you and this instrument. Yeah. Hours and hours and hours a day. And I'm such a social creature. Um, it was it was the wrong fit. Now I, I truly enjoy it for leisure. It's now I play and I've, I've gotten very good at playing everything I hear. Like that's become my, my thing now is like, I'll, I listened to the Lion King score for six months and I taught it to myself without cheap music. Like that's wow. what, that's so what I've been doing. Yeah. You were essentially a prodigy. I guess. I don't know. When did you start playing at five or something? Four. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. I started. And it was, it, you were instantly picked it up. I could hear, I, I could hear so well that I could pick up, I could imitate anything I heard. Um, which, That's amazing. That's a gift. Yeah. Yeah. I could, I didn't love reading music. I didn't sound at all like a prodigy as I was stumbling through the standard Beethoven sonatas and Mozart sonatas because it was so regimented. And mm -hmm. I was, I learned, I did learn to play them well and I actually did learn to enjoy them. But, um, my pleasure came from like, oh my God, what's that harmony? And I will play this thing until I find it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's where I derive my joy with playing the piano now. It's like a big challenge and I'll find something harmonically nearly impossible. And I will refuse to buy the sheet music because I want to find it without the sheet music. I clearly still like- You, you want to make things harder on yourself, yes, I see. Yes, clearly. clearly. <laughs> Um, but there's a real satisfaction when you when you get it. I can imagine. I I I, I uh, yeah. That's that's beautiful. So yeah, that was my you know Cal Arts was such a wondrous, fantastic place. Um, but yeah, I called my mom. I had a conversation with her. I was like, look, I'm learning about the business world. Maybe not in the best way. I've made some connections with people that have nothing at all to do with the school. They're adults. Um, if I get a little carried away, they might you know, they, they're going to want their money and not, you know, this kind of conversation. And my mom got on a plane, showed up, literally showed up. I believe Wit was at home with me when my mom showed up, knocked on the door and um, she's like, okay, we're, we're leaving. I can, you're not going to stay here. We're going home. And I was like, no, I'm not. And she's like, yeah, you are. Cause I'm not going to help subsidize any of this. Um, not going to pay tuition. I imagine that you can probably make enough money to pay your rent uh, with what you're doing, but you're not going to be able to do school and that full time. So it's probably best for you to leave. And I cried and cried and cried and I packed up my life and I grabbed my cat Sunface. At the time I had a cat named Sunface with one blue eye and one green eye and God bless him. He survived college, graduate school, relationships. He even moved down here to Florida with me um, before he passed away. I had that cat for 20 years. He was really? my, my closest relationship, yeah, to date. That's intense. That's a long lifespan for a cat. Yeah, I, I found him um, in Los Angeles uh, like two weeks before I got into CalArts. 
So you mean like found him on the streets of Valencia? Uh, it, no, it was, I was living in, um, the, it was God, it was like studio city area. So you were living in studio city and going to CalArts. I didn't remember that. No, I moved to Valencia after I got into CalArts, but I was living oh, okay. with in studio city. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, a wacky girl, but whatever. That's <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Right. Um, so yeah, so he came with me to CalArts and there was a period of time where I lived in my car for a couple of weeks and he lived in the car with me. It was amazing. He was amazing. So yeah. Yeah, but do you and have a photo? Of Sunface? Yeah. Oh gosh. I mean, I'm sure that I do, but I don't think that I am. Oh, if you don't have it accessible, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, I'm just yeah, curious. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so what? Ha so you left. I mean, uh, I mean, we did Ah Wilderness with Eugene O'Neill's Ah Wilderness, and and I remember that was like that really brought our our class together because it was you know it's about a family essentially, yes. and yes. it was the it was the opposite of Long Day's Journey into Night, which which is the dysfunctional version and our wilderness was eugene o'neill's dream of what is he wanted his family to be like yes yes and and it did create a family scene for us and you and sarah were the best parents any one of us could have ever had oh <laughs> i mean that's how i remember it yeah it it uh well i was i was you know playing a drunk but uh <laughs> sid i remember that uh but um but yeah, I just, I, I, you were so vibrant and uh, I, it was just, it was beautiful. And I said, did you have any desire to continue acting at all after CalArts or was that like, you're like, ah, fuck it. I, I did, I did. I very much had the desire to, to continue to do acting, but it, having to leave, first of all, not being permitted to stay in the department kind of broke my heart in a very big way. Cause here is like, okay, here we go back to the piano again. Mm -hmm. It's like this, this blasted piano. It's always going to come back to this piano. Um, I'm never going to be as good at anything else as I am at this piano. Mm -hmm. um, and when I moved back home, it was, it was really like, it became very apparent that I could not even stay with my grandmother for a week. Yeah. So you had to go back to grandma's. Yeah. Yeah, they brought me back to grandma's. Um, my mom had some guy living in her house. I didn't want to be around any of that. Um, not not the best decisions that she could have made. And I don't, I'm going to keep her privacy private because that's her story. Right. Um, yeah. But it wasn't an option to live with her. Um, and so uh, very quickly, it was like, got a studio apartment, got a job at Starbucks two years of undergraduate college i did wind up walking away with two years of undergraduate credits um, from cal arts and i was working at barnes and noble first and then at starbucks and i met a woman who was 11 years older than me from south america and i was attracted to her um, she told me she wasn't gay, but then she moved in like three weeks later into my little studio apartment. She was actually closeted for multiple years. It wound up impacting our relationship pretty badly because she came from a very conservative Catholic uh, Spanish family. Um, but she was so practical and so red, such, such a Republican. She was like, it's great. You're a great piano player. It's wonderful. I'm sure, I'm sure that you're an excellent actor, but like, how are you going to pay for stuff? And and she just kept saying that over and over and over again. Like, you're going to go back to school for what? What are you, you going to do with that? Yeah. Um, now, now, had you come out at that point? I, I had not come out per se uh, to myself. I had. I, I started to understand that the, the, the physical re response that I have to women is just significantly different than it is to men. And I have, I've never been a, an anarchist feminist. I don't hate men. Uh, I don't think they're terrible. Um, I think it's a shame that lesbians have that reputation because I think that a lot of lesbians really do feel that way. Like, oh, gross, dude. Um, I never felt that way. I dated 
guys. But I, the way that I t- explained it to my mom to make it a little bit more palatable for her was my mom is a, is a huge fan of ice cream. It is her guilty pleasure. And she likes really decadent ice cream. So Hagen okay. does or Kaiba. And, um, you know, she, at first she said to me, I'd rather you be a whore. Whoa. Then she, then she said to me, um, I'm going to, st- I'm going to take sun face away from you. And I just laughed. I was like, that's ridiculous. Um, and then maybe a year or two later, like, you know, Elizabeth and I were already living together. Um, you know, and it was, it was, it was tough because Thanksgivings, holidays, birthdays, my family was just, they weren't, she wasn't welcome. And I wasn't ever going to be the kind of person that would leave my girlfriend behind and go have Thanksgiving dinner with my family. Um, yeah. so, so I started ha- making Thanksgiving dinners for all the stragglers that had no place to go. Mm-hmm. And my family realized that it's like, oh, she's not going to choose us over this lifestyle. Okay. And they started to have to get a little bit more flexible, but I, you know, uh, it was, I was having dinner with my mom one night and I tried to explain, she goes, well, why? Why have, why are you, why did you do this to me? Of course. Why did I become gay because, or was born gay? Why did I do this to you? Um, and I said, mom, you know, the truth is, is like, she goes, but you had boyfriends and you liked them. So like, maybe this is just a phase. And I said, mom, okay. So you know how you like your, your Belgian dark chocolate haagen And she goes, yeah. And I said, is it, is it super satisfying for you? Is it what you really crave when you want ice cream? Yeah. I said, well, supposing you could have chocolate frozen yogurt for the rest of your life. Like, is it sweet? Yeah. Is it probably lighter and healthier for you? Maybe. But you will never again have your haagen that you savor and you crave. From now on, because I think so, and I think it's better for you, you will never be allowed to have that again. And amazingly enough, it somehow registered. Like, yeah, it's palatable. I don't hate it, but I don't love it. Mm -hmm. I'm not passionate about it. It doesn't stir me. Um, It's sad that I had to make a food analogy. Like you would think my mother would be a little more sophisticated than that, but I made the right analogy because she started to understand. Like you're asking me to settle for less than what I could have. Don't, don't you want me to have the Hagen dazs Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually brilliant because you're, you're, you met her where she could understand it. And like, you know, a lot of times are, are, as you know, as a therapist is, is trying to get the right, you know, the idea across in a way that somebody will understand it. And, and you knew that's how she would understand it. So you, that that's perfect. Right. I get, I suppose so. Um, but she has come a very far away because um, that was, that was, you know, 15, 16 years ago. And I've dated other people and had my heart broken and fallen in love since then. And um, it was maybe two years ago or something that she said, I really hope you meet a woman that's worthy of you. And I about fell out of my chair because that was, that was huge. That was a really big, big step for her. Um, and it, it meant a lot to me. So, so she's come around. Did you tell her that when it, when it happened? I said, Oh my God, mom. Yeah, I sure did. I said, wow, mom. Wow. Did you just say that? (laughs) Oh my gosh, mom. Yes. I was very excited. It was a very big deal. And has that brought you closer since that moment? Yes. Yes, it has. Because I, you know, I, I can talk to her. I feel like I can share stuff if I get annoyed or if my girlfriend does something that's upsetting, you know, do you know what she did? It's great that I can do that now. Um, I miss that. I didn't really have a, mo- a mother. I had an aunt and a grandmother. They played a huge role in my life. My mother would. My mother was very talented in getting you dry ice in in December at three o'clock in the morning from across state lines. Like, my mother had a knack for doing impossible things. Okay. But she's um, extremely awkward socially. Mm-hmm. Feels very uncomfortable in her own skin. Um, the, the, I think the most profound compliments she's ever given me were indirect because she would she would say, "I don't even understand how I made you. Like I don't even understand how how you happened." 
Um, I mean, she has some idea. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently I was, apparently I was made in a swimming pool. Really? Not very far away from where I live now, which is interesting. Yep. Huh. Yep. yep. Were, were they married at the time or were they, was it? They, I think they got married when she got pregnant. Okay. Uh, I think they loved each other very much. Um, he had grown up in a very abusive household in Lithuania. Mm -hmm. um, his father, stories, stories were that his father died of a heart attack when he was 36 years old. My father's father, whose name was Abraham, who apparently I resemble very, very strongly. Mm -hmm. um, but Have Abraham, you gone back there to Lithuania this, to see your roots? Okay. I've gone to Moscow to see my mother's roots. Mm -hmm. I spent three weeks there um, when I was, just as Pitistroika was happening, it was Gorbachev's Russia. Um, the US dollar was like, I had $5 and we could eat and drink for like two weeks uh, and buy souvenirs. It was a remarkably strange time to be in Russia. I guess it was 1990. Right. Uh, so politically it was just, and I was 12 years old and I was an American kid in, in Levi's, you know, and I was just, it was like, they were awestruck, awestruck because the women were still wearing dresses and skirts. And my mother walking around in her own Levi's jeans was like, wow, look at this woman, how inappropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and people said that to her, what, what kind of woman? She's smoking a cigarette, wearing jeans. And it was like, oh, what is going on here? Um, and my mom would very politely tell them to fuck off in mm -hmm. Russian. Um, <laughs> So. How do you say it? Can I just hear it just so I can hear what it sounds like? Well, it's actually, if you want to know, it, it's a little crude or, and, and crass, but it's it's idi nahui, which literally translates to suck my dick. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what is it? What, was there something about Russia that you connected to that you felt like at home or how did you feel when you were there? I did not connect to Russia herself uh as a home but the culture the music and the food mm -hmm. are very much my own mm -hmm. like i when i when i cook for myself wow well, i live in a neighborhood where i hear russian language now um i russian music that really describes cities in russia that i've never seen or heard of that that are very very deep and personal to me you don't even know where that is. That's, it was like the prison camps, Stalin's prison camps. There's a lot of, I guess, slang, uh, pop music that was coming out, bard music that was coming out um, in the 50s and 60s in Russia. And I know that stuff. I know that music. Mm -hmm. I listen to that music. I know the words. And I'll have to call, I'll call my mom and say, hey, where's this? She's like, why are you asking me this? And I'm like, well, mom, I don't know. I, I, the way I understand it, some guy broke ranks because he saw a cigarette butt with lipstick on it and he got beaten for it because he hadn't seen a woman in three months and he, he saw a cigarette butt with lipstick on it and he broke ranks and ran after it just to hold it and put it in his mouth. I mean, that's a hell of a song. And it's yeah. you know, guitar strumming and very beautiful and very sad. Um, Russian culture is very deep, right? I mean, from, from the writing to the music to the to the ballet uh, and theater a, a very much so sure so I am I am deeply proud of my Russian roots deeply proud of my Russian roots and Do I speak have... better now than I did when I was a kid really yep so I uh, so you you continue to uh, practice it I speak with my with my mother and my aunt pretty much mm -hmm. every day um, my aunt insists that we speak Russian when we're hanging out. I, I weave in and out, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And there's there's some idioms like in Russian. For us, if you say "don't blow smoke up my ass," mm -hmm. the Russian equivalent of that is "don't hang noodles from my ears." Can, can I hear um, it? I just want to hear it. Um, don't hang noodles on my ears. Don't blow smoke up my ass. It's really. <laughs> And I think language is so powerful. I think language is probably the most, one of the most powerful uh, things in the world. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. George Carlin. That's why I love his comedy. It's, it's language based. And uh, yeah, you know, I, 
I should state that those that are listening and watching. So when you left CalArts, I did not see you again. Uh, and until now, well, I don't, I can't see you now, but uh, I did not have contact with you. I remember in 2001, right before 9-11, our, our acting class went to New York for our showcase to showcase our, our class before we, you know, when we graduated. Yeah. And I remember just hearing a story and I was pissed because I was like, so Wit, who was in our class and whom you dated, um, I guess he met up with you. And I was like, what the fuck? You met up with Lisa? And he's like, yeah, and she's dating an older woman. And I was like, oh, and I, and I, and I didn't have an opportunity to see you. And I thought, fuck, that was so, we were so close. And, and I was so disappointed. And then, and then, the, but uh, that was the last I had heard about you besides Facebook. But. And then, and then we found each other on Facebook and I don't remember who found whom, um, but I was so glad to see you. I, I'm so, I, I'm deeply glad to see you now. And I'm, I'm don't even have the, the, the appropriate words for how, how I feel about the fact that you can't see. Um, because the way that you saw the world, you were always so tender and so compassionate and so patient. And I, what really did have a bit of wilderness to, to my spirit you know, in, at that period of time when you knew me and you always tolerated like whatever shit I was pulling, <laughs> like with a warm and friendly smile, you never, I never felt judged or um, frowned down upon by you. You were so warm and so supportive. I actually remember a moment where I had period cramps and it was in a movement class. And I guess I bent over in some way that you read my body language and you were like, Ooh, is it that, is it that time of month or something? And I remember looking at you thinking, is he for real? Like, wow, how, how is he getting that kind of awareness? And I said to you, how could you tell? And you said, it's something about how you're, you're, you put your foot, you turned your foot inward and your knee turned inward. And it sort of indicated that it was, it was the, um, oh gosh, you said something along the lines of like, it, it looks like your uterus hurts. And really? I was like, how, how on earth could you possibly know that? Um, but I remember that because it was very special. Well, I'm, I'm a uterus whisperer. That's, uh, <laughs> that's that what I'm known for is, <laughs> is, 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 yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I have no recollection of that, but I appreciate you mentioning it because uh, that's, you know, an insight into my thinking at the time. But I do remember, I, I remember the, the sense of the wildness and I, I kind of wanted to live vicariously through you at that point, because uh, you had told me some, some things that you had done. And I was like, Hey, that's intense. Wow. And then, uh, and I remember, I remember I, I, you may or may not remember this, but um, I got really drunk in preparation for, to play Sid in our wilderness. And yeah. I went to an art opening and I was just wasted and obnoxious. And I was trying to do that because that was the character was a just obnoxious, drunk, alcoholic. And I remember um, uh, Jesse, do you remember uh, uh, Jessica oh, Kendall? <laughs> yeah, she played my love interest and, and I was supposed to, we were, you know, it was that struggle, uh, you know, between us and, you know, her being exasperated by my drinking and, you know, she show up and I'd be like, Hey, you know, I was trying to like, be like, it's all right. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm maintaining. And, and it was that experiment, you know, that kind of method acting experiment of doing that. And I, I think I was pr probably pretty obnoxious. And I do remember talking with you at the art opening. I have no idea what I said. I kind of do. You kind of know what you said. You kind of remember what you said. I, I think I might've been pretty drunk at that art opening myself because I, I remember interacting with you and I remember being very surprised that you were hammered. Right. That just wouldn't, that wasn't a behavior that you would have typically, I would have typically seen you do um, is be, be hammered, but I don't remember exactly what our exchange was now. Yeah, I, I don't remember either, but I remember because Rob had bought me uh, like he bought me, like, I don't know, it was like a 12 pack of Bud Light. And, uh, because I wasn't 21 yet. And, um, was that's Rob what I, 21? what's that? Was Rob 21 at the time. Yeah. Rob, Robert Thomas. And uh, you're aware of what happened, right? I just know that he's no longer with us. Yeah. Yeah. He was murdered. Yeah. He was murdered. No, I didn't know that. 
Yeah, um, apparently, I, and I don't know if this is the truth. Uh, I just know that I guess uh, I, I really don't know what happened. All I know is that he was shot and um, and killed. And I've, re I, I've heard rumors about what the details are, but I, I just know that, um, yeah, he, he lost his life in um, a couple of years ago in 2017, I think, or was it? Yeah, it was something like that. It was it was fairly recent. So, yeah, yeah, and I, I and I go ahead. Go, go ahead. You, you know, you go ahead. No, I think you know. I think somehow in my head, it yeah, I got my um my my story mixed up a little bit because you yes, you were with Jesse for in all wilderness, and Rob and Sarah were our parents. And yeah, yeah, that's what it was. I was Uncle Sid. Yes, yeah. and. And, 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 uh, but, um, but yeah, I was kind of a, you know, you were, you were, you were an authority that I remember. You yeah. Were. I was an adult and right. you were playing the, the, you know, the children. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I think about Rob a lot because he and I, we had to, in Claudia's speech class during the second year, he and I had to, uh, learn each other's, um, speech patterns and basically, mimic each other and study each other and so we had to we spent a lot of time together and he told me stories and i was learning how he talked and you know we had to do like a, a presentation of each other so he did an impression of me and i did an impression of him and That's so awesome. we got close through that and and i was because he was such a gentle uh loving compassionate person and it was just so sad to hear that his he'd been taken away from us so young that it's it's tragic. That was yeah. very very tragic. It was very hard for me to process. Yeah. And I think I just sort of compartmentalized it in a place where I don't let myself think about it. And I I now I'm feeling remorseful of that because he certainly deserves my thoughts and consideration. So I hope that he is resting. So do you feel you compartmentalize a lot? Well, I've I've had to. Sure. Yeah. In order wow. to survive? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had to, um, I, I have very little patience give it. And it's interesting what I do for a, a living because I'm extremely empathic and I can sense a wounded person. And I, you know, I told you when you asked me how I like to be introduced, I, I, I also kind of was joking around and saying, I like to advocate for the underdog. Um, but I also have a very, very direct way of saying, okay, that's horrible. And I'm so, so terribly sorry that that happened to you. And now what? So when I start a new relationship with adult patients, that's not the same approach you can take with a child. You can't do that with a child. But when a 30 year old, 40 year old, 50 year old person who has been wounded um, comes to me for therapy, I, I say to them that I am not for the faint of heart. Like this is not going to be a sugar-coated version of who you are to make you feel better about yourself. This this can be an evaluation of what has happened to you, what you've how you've survived it. Hopefully without re-traumatizing you because I don't believe psychoanalysis needs to be damaging nor does it need to take 10 years. Um and the idea is the present and what is in, in your control and that's those things are no longer relevant they're just not if you're bringing in the behaviors that have you needed to use in situations where you were in danger um and you're still holding on to them they're no longer serving you and i'm going to call you out because i expect the same of myself Yeah, I know. want you to call me out. I have, I have, I have severe obsessive compulsive disorder. I'd like to turn this into a therapy session. <laughs> I, I actually do. I have severe obsessive compulsive disorder, but, and it, you know, it didn't start until I learned that I was losing my eyesight. Well, so it was, a, it was actually a latch on to everything else that you can control. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, what happened was I remember it very clearly because what happened was, is I learned, I mean, I knew I had hearing loss my whole life. So I dealt with that 
you know, with hearing devices, it, I felt somewhat normal. And then, um, and then what happened was, is I learned the first year at the end of my first year at CalArts, I learned that I have Usher syndrome type 2A, which is causes blindness and deafness. And the I part is retinitis pigmentosa. And so um, I remember very vividly like that. I feel like maybe it was, might've been the next summer, but I remember right before I left to go home, I remember like, I, I looked at the, we had a gas stove in my apartment. I remember looking at the dials and I kept checking them over and over again, like, you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And I kept, and I was like, what the fuck is this about? Why am I doing this? And then, you know, I, I left and I didn't think anything of it. And I really didn't have any symptoms until later on as my, my eyesight kind of diminished. And then a bunch of shit started to poke, you know, come up with the germophobia and um, um, a bunch of shit. Or, and then, was there a ritual, was there ritualized behaviors, locking doors, cracks in sidewalks, like those? Not kinds before of that. Not before nothing, huh? No. And, and most, for the most part in my twenties, I was pretty, I didn't, I mean, I did not have germophobia. I was, you know, I smoked, I, you know, I touched stuff and I didn't give a shit. And, you know, because you, when you're, you, you, as you know, as a smoker, you, you, you know, you'll touch doors and then you'll have a cigarette and touch your face. And, you know, yeah. and I didn't think about that shit, you know, I didn't think about it at all, but, but later on it, it, as I developed as my, I think my eyesight, it, it was kind of parallel as my eyesight diminished. So did uh, the, the OCD, the obsessions and compulsions increased. But again, I think that that actually makes all the sense in the world because you were losing control of one of the most quintessential functions of humanity of being a human being. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's, that's a very traumatic, shocking reality to, to walk into. Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, it, 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 it was, it was odd. It would, because it was, it waxed and waned. It wasn't always, you know, it was in low lighting. I'd had, I had, I had issues. I'd bump into things, but I also avoided situations just so I could feel normal. So, sure. you know, like for instance, I, I, I didn't go to any clubs like dance clubs or anything. And I'd be like, ah, I'm not into that. But I think it was, it was a subconscious to like decision to be like, you know, you're probably going to run into shit in there and it's probably not the best environment for you. So why don't you just say you don't like it? And, you know, and that's kind of how I operated for most of my life, but. Wow. Well, and how are you now? My, my obsessions and compulsion, uh, compulsions are, are pretty bad, but um, in, in some cases, but I know they're, they're bullshit. I, I know it. And I, I have something called moral thought action fusion, which you're probably aware of um, as a component of it. And that's kind of like always present. And I'm always like, ah, oh, what the fuck is this? I know, I know it's about a loss of control and a, a betrayal of my body. And I don't have control. I, I, I understand it. It's just some days I'm not able to, uh, and I, I, I got off medication and all that stuff because um, I, I had, I mean, for 15 years, I go to psychologists and, 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 and psychiatrists and I'd be on medications and all the side effects. And I was just like, fuck, I, I felt like a, the balance was the, the um, cost benefit wasn't really there, <laughs> you know? So I just kind of like, ah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I deal with it now. I still have, I mean, with COVID, you know. Yes, I was going to actually ask that next. Yeah, um, I mean, with COVID, it's it's definitely worsened. Um, but the more I, I kind of close my eyes and embrace what's happening to me, the, the you know, the, the, the everything starts to go away. And, 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 and I think the more I, I call myself out on it and just be like, that's bullshit, stop. Stop the rituals because the rituals, as you know, make everything more, uh, it, it increases the anxiety and, sure. and makes everything worse. And you think and it's, much it's more difficult, much more difficult because then, you know, if the routine is broken, then it's, you know, the, the kind of the consequences are, they're perceived to be these horrific, dire consequences, which are really not there. Yeah, exactly. Not, and so I, I, what I try to do is when I start to do a ritual, I'm like, stop, stop this shit. Like just, just, 
and then I, I let it go. And then, but it, it always kind of comes back and it's always there. So I'm, I'm learning to kind of live with it and realize it's, it's bullshit. And uh, I know that I think part of it is, is, you know, it's, it's, it's part of it's my work situation. I need to change that so that, you know, I'm doing, because part of why I'm doing this is kind of to find my voice again and find that creative spirit that I've lost. Because what I did was, is I started out, you know, doing acting. And then when I learned that I had Usher syndrome, uh, and then I started having issues like working backstage and low lighting and running into things, I was like, oh, I'm going to stop doing this. And I'm going to go on to directing. And I do directing and then I'd be like, I'm losing more eyesight. It's just isn't going to work either. And then I went into film and then, and, 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 and so I'm like, I can look at a screen. I could see that well. And then when the screen started to go away, I changed to something else. So I kept, and, and the problem is it was a very ableist kind of way of thinking. And what I should have done is just embrace my disability and said, I'm going to do what I want to do, but I'm going to do it differently. And so that's kind of where I want to go now is I want to go back to this creative work because that's where my heart is. And then what brings me joy in living. And it's, it's also uh, allows me to be in control. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, see, you're very natural at this. This, this is the, this is extremely comfortable. I mean, yes, I, we know each other, but again, I mean, how many we've mentioned now multiple times, we haven't seen each other in over 20 years. Uh, and I, you're very, very natural and great at this. And I feel empathy and I feel like I'm being heard and your questions are coming from a very sincere, you're curious, you want to know. So I think this is kind of a great fit for you, Brian. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I enjoy it because I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful to this moment that's happening right now. Like to, I can, I feel like you're right here with me and, and, and I can feel your presence and I, and everything that we had, like when we had those conversations and like those intense things, I mean, I can, I remember that like the, I always had that and carried that with me throughout my life. And, and it's, it's wonderful to reconnect with you and, and, and feel that again. And like, yeah, it's very vivid. It's very vivid for me as well. My, I have goosebumps. Oh, so. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. So let's kind of, let's get back on track a little bit. Let's, um, my, my wife's going to say uh, I'm, I'm diverting or uh, because she says I don't talk about myself enough and, um, and that I always change the subject when it goes on to me, which is, I don't believe is entirely true, but, but I like to focus on. No, but thank you for trusting me and, and your listeners with that information about yourself. That's a vulnerable, that's a vulnerable thing to do. And so if you're, if you're talking with me or whoever you're going to be speaking with, um, the idea is for candor and vulnerability because that's what makes humanity so beautiful. Um, so thank you for sharing that about yourself. That is not an easy thing to deal with at all. That is, that is some hard shit to deal with, Brian. It's like, it's tough. Thank you. Thank you for uh, acknowledging that. I, I appreciate it. Um, because welcome. sometimes I, 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 I'm, you know, my first thought is somebody has it worse. You That's know? always true. Um, nevertheless, yeah. that uh, you, you calling, you calling bullshit um, is a very helpful coping mechanism to kind of also deter some of the behaviors mm -hmm. but it it can be very invalidating so i would be more careful with being so dismissive about the process because it's you're actively working on changing of behaviors that are incredibly difficult to change so that part's not bullshit yeah and i, I mean a part of it I, I as i see it you know my father has ocd as well so um, I remember, I, I, I remember the things he do, he did and I, and I'm, and I'm, I see myself doing, I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? And we had a weird experience together. Um, he, he had cancer in, uh, 2008 or no, no, it was just, yeah, 2008. And I drove him from Stanford to where he lives, um, because he had, you know, he had just received chemo and radiation treatment and, um. Sorry. And I remember um, um, what happened. We were in his house and he, he's very 
OCD about, you know, things being, you know, as far as being clean and also being in a certain order. Like he has this like Persian rug and the, you know, has those tassels that hang off and he like, literally he, he brushes them. So they're perfectly straight and even, and I, I, you know, I, I was walking across the room and I messed them up and he like saw it and he like got all upset. And then he like, he had the brush and he like sat down and he says, what am I fucking doing? You know, wow. and and it was interesting to see him have that realization, you know. Huh. Anyway, but I want to get back. I want to get back to you because this is why we're here. So. Okay. So, yeah. So I what happened after after. So you went to Columbia and. So, so what happened after was I get these I met I meet this woman who's very pragmatic very practical and, and some bizarre way and a reinterpretation of my grandmother, hyper controlling, like, don't wear your jeans so baggy. And she was, I, you know, when I think of it now, I was 20 and she was 34. I don't understand what the hell she was doing with a 20 year old, because that's just such a huge difference, right? In where you are in your life. Um, biologically, uh, I was 20. Yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't, I couldn't go buy myself a beer. Um, and she was, you know, middle adulthood. So was there, a, was there a little bit of like mothering kind of going on? You would think, uh, I was actually the one that was more prepared for, for tragedies. I was the one that was more prepared when there was an accident. I was the one that was more prepared when there were emergencies. Um, she just had been very coddled in her life by her family had never had any any traumatic incidents. God bless her. That's very rare, but it does happen for some people. Um, so the entire thing was very jarring for her to like love love this girl because I wasn't a woman fully yet. Mm -hmm. she, she was closeted so gay woman who fell in love with a girl and couldn't resist this girl and you know wound up leaving the comfort of her family's protection to move in with this 20 year old girl. And then suddenly it very much became, how are we going to, you know, survive practically? Like, well, you're going to go to NYU with play the piano. What the hell? Mm -hmm. uh, and I loved her and she, she it, there was some element of truth to that because I didn't want to have to ask my family for any help of any kind. And I wanted to get to a place where I didn't need any help from anyone. So I took my two years of <laughs> Cal arts, um, bachelor in fine arts credits. And I went to SUNY purchase, um, because they accepted them. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a liberal arts school. They had a theater department and a music department. So they basically, they said, look, you know, we don't actually see any academics of any kind. We don't know where, how you would do. So why don't you take a class and show us that you're not going to fail it. And we will admit you mm -hmm. into our bachelors of liberal arts. Mm -hmm. So I did that. I took a couple of classes that I enjoyed very much. And the cerebral part of my brain woke up. And one of them was an experimental, okay, psych 101, like there's crazy in my house. Let's, let's learn about this. And the psych 101 turned into abnormal psych, which then turned into child psychology, which then all of a sudden it was music, theater and psychology credits. So by the time I graduated, and I was very proud because my, I, I graduated cum laude and gotten into Columbia for graduate school, but it was kind of, they were like, you have a minor in psychology, it's just, that's what you got. So it was a bachelor's in liberal arts with a minor in psychology. And um, I'd had a professor who was a recovering addict, who was the greatest guy. And he said to me, you really, you have this intensity. <laughs> He goes, you would make a really, really excellent therapist. Um, you, you're going to connect to people. You're actually going to be effective. There's, there are so many shit therapists out there and they're garbage. Um, you won't be. So you should apply. And I did. I applied to Stony Brook. I applied to NYU. They turned me down because I turned them down for music. So they turned me down for the master's program. Very um, vindictive. Yeah. I actually was <laughs> upset about that one. Um, and I went to Columbia um, on the off chance that I could walk around and see the campus. And I stumbled around in the, in the psychology master's program. And it was like, no, there was no school in session. 
It was a very similar to Fran Bennett type situation because a, a professor sort of was like, can I help you? And I said, I'm just looking around. I applied here. I'm like one in how many thousands of applicants. I just wanted to get a feel for the place. And she said, well, why don't you come in and talk to me? Mm -hmm. So I walked into her office and I saw that every book on her shelf had to do with cultural diversity and different cultures and cultural appropriation. And there was some political stuff. So she asked me, what are you interested in? I said, I'm, well, I'm very interested in different cultures. Um, and she goes, is that right? And I said, well, yeah, I come from a Russian culture and I live with an Ecuadorian and I'm gay. And, you know, culturally it's been very challenging. I told her my story, but I kind of found what she would be interested in hearing about my life. Mm -hmm. So it was real, just like the Chekhov. Like that was real. I really do speak Russian. Um, did I, ha did I have any intention of like, you know, majoring in cultural diversity? No. And I didn't do that. But that moment was pivotal because she remembered me and she made sure to ask me my name before we had, we talked for maybe 15 minutes. And then I got my acceptance letter, like, you know, three weeks later. Um, so she goes, did you just, did you just decide to just like come here in the hopes of talking to someone? I said, to be honest with you, I just decided to come here. I didn't know what was going to happen. I just felt like I need to get on the train and come check out the school. And she said, did you do that with the other schools you applied to? Because she asked me, where did you apply to? Um, and I told her about Dr. Knack, who was the, the SUNY Stony Brook, I'm sorry, the SUNY Purchase professor who kept pushing me to go into therapy. She mm -hmm. goes, oh, I know Bill Knack really well. I know him personally. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, okay, well, yeah, he was kind of the guy who motivated me to make these decisions, and he felt very strongly about this program. Um, and she goes, okay, all right. And did you go check out SUNY Stony Brook? I said, no. She said, did you go check out NYU? I said, no. Did you go check out Fordham? I said, no. She goes, so just this program that you decided to come and check out? I said, yes, it was the truth. She said, okay. And she jotted down my name and was super casual and didn't kind of give me any impression either here nor there other than the, the very specific questions that she asked me, which now I understand were very deliberate specific questions. And, um, but she framed them, she was a quintessential psychologist and framed them in a way that we were talking about the weather or like what I had for lunch, um, which, you know, it was masterful. It was masterfully done because when I got that letter, I was shocked. Um, now this is Columbia, correct? Was the, the master's program yeah now it's interesting so uh, there's a, a parallel here with the cal arts so uh, i the one thing i missed though is the cal arts was why cal arts oh well because you know i had moved all right so there's a little chunk that we did miss which were this the earlier years my mom saw me after a, a night of partying said you can't live here you can't, you can't stay here anymore. This place is dangerous for you, making terrible decisions. And I was like, oh, that's pot calling kettle black. Really? <laughs> um, but uh, she, they sent me to boarding school. I told them not to. My mother did not have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. she, she worked very, very hard and saved every penny um, so that I, she could give me something. Um, mm. My dad had died. Like he was not in the picture at all. And um, she took this money that she had worked many years to save and plunked it into Cheshire Academy, which is a, a very like preppy prep school, you know, waspy, wealthy kids that played polo. And I'm like a street rat from Brooklyn. And I was like, mom, this is a terrible idea. You're gonna waste your money. I'm not gonna stay here. It's not gonna work. No, 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 this is great. These are, these are the kind of people you want to be friends with. These, this is what's going to get you into a really great college. No, no, you have to do this. this all of our savings, like the whole family has pooled their money to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so by November, they expelled me. Um, and then it was like, what do we do with her? Shit, can't go back to Brooklyn, got kicked out of the school. I, they, they, they did give her back some of the tuition money. Um, because they basically said, we've never seen anyone deliberately try so hard to get, like it was three in-house suspensions 
<laughs> and then and then finally they were just like yeah she's gonna set our house she's gonna set our school on fire you like just here take your money and take this kid out of here and i never i didn't that's that's not literally what they said but they were like this is not the right fit mm -hmm. um she is miserable here uh we, we we're trying we think she's smart we think she's talented she's very likable she's got friends and I, I'm still friends with some people from Cheshire Academy, even though I was only there for three months, um, that I still talk to actually. But uh, they were like, you, here's ma'am, we were gonna reimburse you a chunk of this tuition. She can't stay here. <laughs> so, so where so, is that school? It's in Connecticut. Okay, okay. Uh, so there's I, probably, you, you probably went to school with some of the billionaires, right? That, you know, control yep. the world. I probably did. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I, it was miserable. I hated it. I wore sunglasses to class. Um, mm -hmm. I refused to wear the uniform. I had this suit, this black and white pinstripe suit. Maybe there was some acting or costuming at the very least that I was fascinated by because I took on the persona of like a, like a street thug. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I religiously stuck to it. I was in character for three months. Wow. Like I, I never dropped character. Um, so I was just like, yeah, I, I, and I wore this suit and, and I, I wore this suit and I wore these sunglasses and I, um, shiny shoes. Um, I, it was ridiculous. <laughs> when I think of it now, it was completely ridiculous. They did have a psychodrama class there that I liked very much. And it was very strange uh, experience. Mm -hmm. they, put you, they put you in a cage to see how you would feel and it was very, very dark and very, very moving. And I kind of have stayed away from psychodrama from that point on, never ever let myself even veer into that territory, which you would think would be a natural thing for me to want to explore given my history. Mm -hmm. Nope, nope, not interested. Maybe some dark things should just stay buried. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so that didn't work out, Boris who is the only other child in my small immediate family was in Chicago with his girlfriend. They were both getting their master's degrees at the university of Chicago. And she stepped up because she, they had been dating through high school and she had known me from the time I was 12. And at this point I'm 17 and a junior in high school. And she said, let her come live with us. Just let her come live with us. There's an academy here. There's a performing arts academy. I will get her an audition. In Chicago? In Chicago. Did you meet Matt there? Matt Dittman? I sure did. Holy shit. That's a, that's a, there's a connection. You went to we, the same? We, we went to the same school and we worked on the same production of Chicago. I played piano. What the production. fuck? I don't even remember that connection at all. Yeah, it was really, really bizarre. But yeah, Dittman and I knew each other from the, the Chicago Academy for the Arts. Did you date Dittman? No, oh, no, okay. no, 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 no. I actually met the first girl I really, truly ever loved without knowing that she was the first girl I ever truly, really loved. Um, at the, the, I was just enamored with her, but I didn't know because I was still dating boys and I didn't know I was gay. Um, but yeah, she, she wound up being the first love of my life, actually. So no, Dittman was not on the periphery because she was a redhead that was freckled and god she was just so cute um mm. but yeah so i did know Dittman and we did work on the same production of chicago the musical while i was in chicago going to the chicago academy for the arts uh which is very special if you ask me i i interviewed him just a few interviews ago and he did not mention that he probably forgot probably <laughs> that was ages ago <laughs> Um, but yeah, if you do speak with him, ask him, ask him about the, the production of Chicago that he did in high school. Are you aware of what happened to Matt? Yeah. No. Um, a few weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago, his fiance, who he had been with for about 10 years, um, suddenly died and, uh, she had, um, I don't know. I, I don't know what, but she had some type of infection and she was in the hospital for three weeks and then she died. She was 34 years old. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's, uh, deep in the depths of grief right now. And, um, oh, oh, 
but he has he has friends from Chicago that are with him that he calls Operation Distraction. So uh, he, I think he's doing okay. He, he sent me a message uh, yesterday. I was I actually still need to respond to him. Brian, but. I am so sorry. My very dramatic family has tried to call like ten times. They must have forgotten that I was doing this interview. Uh -huh. so I'm just take going to take one moment to text in and interview no let's make let's make a, 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 just call him and we'll, we'll have a conversation really if you want um okay i will i will call right now and let my mother know to calm down yeah, <laughs> yeah she still tends to get hysterical i'm 40 but make sure you let her know that she's being recorded so that she's not self say it immediately otherwise oh yeah no i will yeah. i will talk her so she doesn't um say something stupid okay or embarrass herself or myself. <laughs> mama, mama, yeah, I'm in an interview right now. A который live происходит, который записывается, который я Дианке говорила насчет этого уже три раза повторяла. Что именно? Что у меня сейчас делаю интервью live. <laughs> Mom, I have to go, okay? Все нормально? Мама, пожалуйста, я сейчас делаю интервью, хорошо? Да, потом ты мне дашь траки на маму, окей? Да. Окей. I so, think I got da. So the first thing she said was, have you lost your fucking mind? <laughs> <laughs> And actually what that call was about is a plant that um, I had sent her for Mother's Day that, sh that sh Amazon, I guess, didn't bring it. And she called four times. My aunt called three times. The phone is silenced. Mm -hmm. Now my aunt had forgotten. I had told her that I was interviewing with you. I had mentioned that I had talked to you. She remembered you. She said, I remember him. I remember you talking about him, which I really what 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 was the discussion? Well, I said you were you. I don't know if you remember, but I had a friend named Brian at Cal Arts, and he was we did we did all wilderness, and we, he was in Craig's acting class with me. And she goes, I remember, I remember you talking about Brian. He was very handsome, because I showed I used to show her pictures of you guys mm -hmm. with Aaron. Um, I had actually Wit gave me some face shots, head shots um, that you guys had put together for yeah your, for our our showcase yeah. And I, I had one of your headshots for years. I lost the folder when I moved from New York to Florida, but I had yours, I had Sarah's, I had Jesse's. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if he, if he asked you guys or he just stole them for me because I asked him to. Okay. Uh, but I, uh, so she, I said, and I said, yeah, Brian asked me for an interview. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I, I, I said, yes, I was very excited to like reconnect with him and that's what I'm doing this evening. So I guess she's eating and she goes, you know, I just asked Diana, who is her sister, who is my aunt, who is my probably biggest ally that I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and she goes, she's eating dumplings at a neighbor's house. She didn't tell me shit about your interview. <laughs> <laughs> and, when, and when you get off the phone, I need the tracking number. So that was the extent of <laughs> of our conversation. Um, I love it. Yeah, yeah. So I no, mean, I, they're I, they're still totally crazy. I I had to get I had to get I had to be the normal one. Mm -hmm. Boris Boris just left. Boris left the he took a step back from the family. He married. He has a child, Zachary, my nephew, who's amazing. Um, he was like, I don't want any part of it. There that. They're the crazies. I love them. He loves them. He sends them birthday presents and cards and stuff. But I have to be, they're completely insane. I, I have to be the normal one. <laughs> but it's a choice, right? Yes. So you're, you're you know, this is something that I ask uh, almost everybody I interview, like, especially those that have been through trauma or something like, how do you feel like uh, where, you know, where did, where was that moment that you said, I'm going to take a creative path and, and stay away from the destructive path? Where was that moment for me in my adult life? 
It was a choice between creativity and destructiveness. What do you remember where that was? Um, the creativity was by virtue of ability, mm -hmm. not a choice to not be destructive. The, the continuation of destructive behaviors went with me through all the schools, all the formal education, the move to Florida, the giving up being a therapist and cooking, cooking for a living for six years, um, the burns and the cuts and the kitchen and the heat and the fucking amazing adrenaline deliciousness um, that I experienced. Um, that actually changed three years ago when um, a partner who I loved very, very deeply um, left me. Our relationship was toxic and volatile. Um, she was probably the closest reinterpretation of my grandmother that I had found to date to the, until that moment. Uh, we lived together for six years. Um, she did us both a huge favor by making the move and having the courage to leave the relationship. And it was probably the most devastating of all the things that I had survived and all the violence that I had endured and all of the psychological abuse that I had uh, experienced. Her walking out of my apartment with her bags um, was when a, a decision needed to be made about what the fuck it was I was doing. Like it was suddenly this, this presence of mind like I am mindfully aware of what I am doing. I had coasted through every single experience up until that point without my feet being on the ground. Um, and it was a reckoning because I, my ego was shattered. Um, so I, I, I did some serious therapy. Um, I understood that the abandonment of my mother, the my aunt and uncle taking Boris and flying to friendlier skies and leaving me behind in that dismal hole of a life. Um, I was furious. I didn't allow myself to fully feel a single thing. Um, and then all I felt was pain. Um, and it was insufferable. I mean, I still went to work. I was very fortunate because I was working at an LGBT non-for-profit social services organization. And their entire motto, the place is called SunServe. It still exists. It's, it's a wonderful place. It's, it's changed since I've left. But the place changed my life because I was a mess. And I went to work anyway. Mm -hmm. And they taught me... Uh, healthy compartmentalization and like the pain that you're experiencing every time you step away from the work that you're doing, like you can, you can separate that and not be in pain because you're working. And because you're working, you're learning to be mindful of where you are in the moment and what, what, if you're working and it's, and you're helping another human being, you will lessen your pain. Pain will become a shared experience. People will bring pain into your therapy room. You will share pain. And that's when I, and I would weep on Fridays driving home because it would be the weekend. And I had friends. I still have, I've developed some really strong, great relationships. I've been here for, it'll be 13 years on Memorial Day that I moved to Florida. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't make myself go out. I couldn't make myself enjoy anything. I didn't want to. It was almost like, no, no, I, I'm going to, I'm choosing to suffer. And it was an active decision to sit in pain and misery. Um, and I wept on the ride home every single Friday afternoon because I knew that I didn't have anything to fill my time with that was distracting enough to be away from pain. And I would cry through the whole weekend and go back to work on Monday. And that's when I became fully conscientious of myself, my behaviors, accountability, 
Um, I veered very much to the extreme side of, I must be a monster. This person left this 1600 square foot condo on the water to go live somewhere else. She left our cats. We had cat, a couple of cats together. Yes, yes, stereotypes, lesbians and cats. <laughs> Feel free to laugh because it's totally true. No, I, I mean, I was I was so immersed in what you were saying. I did. I wasn't even thinking of that. No, but. I know, but it's it's funny. Um, so it's okay to bring a little levity. Um, <laughs> um, okay. But even that, even that was it destroyed me. That how could you leave? Because our, our my cat Rupert um, was crushed. That she had left him behind. And it was very much like you were left behind. She didn't love you enough. And, and that was very much me. Like I was weeping for myself and I was very confused. I thought I was weeping for her. I thought I was weeping for my mother. I thought I was weeping for Rupert or for my grandmother who was, you know, poor thing, poor thing, unmedicated, untreated, completely, completely mentally unwell person. Um, but I was weeping for me. I was weeping for the kid. That, that, you know, whose mom made every wrong choice and whose aunt and uncle who love her so much left her there. Um, and I started to get well. I started to kind of like cook for myself again. Um, I rearranged things around my apartment. I bought furniture that I assembled. I saved up my money. I started learning about how to work with children. I started learning about autism because it's so prevalent and I was very curious about it. So it was the first mindful endeavor and what am I actually capable of? I started to want to learn how to play the very complicated harmonies of Hans Zimmer's music without sheet music. Um, and to listen to the songs about Russian war camps in Joseph, Joseph Stalin's era. And um, I started to enjoy things like Game of Thrones and dragons and um, just things that I would never have allowed myself to think about or consider. Um, Harry Potter, Harry Potter became a very huge part of my life. Um, Cause I had read the books when I was younger but I went back and reread the books in, in this frame of mind from this experience and I learned so much about humanity and choices and learning to, that you can always turn on the light. And then I found the person that everybody had seen like, oh, you're this, you're this warm and you're this kind and you're this genuine, sincere person. But I kind of showed her to me. Like, and there was this, this, I apologized. I apologize. I did inner child work that I started researching and I apologized to that kid for everyone that fucked up and did mistakes. And I promised her that I wouldn't do that, that I wouldn't like do a bunch of drugs and have a bunch of sex and go be an actor, go be a chef, go, <laughs> go be a whatever FBI agent, um, just because it was like the whimsy thing in, in this moment. And, and that's kind of, you know, to go back to how we all started this conversation was when I finally got to where I, work and like love what I'm doing and can't wait to come home and make myself dinner and pour myself a glass of wine that I chose because it's going to go really, really well with the steak that I bought for myself. Um, and th there's an episode of Ratched that I'm going to watch and get really excited about it on Netflix. That's when suddenly the, the appreciation of family started to come. And then suddenly a, a, a girl who my mother would say is worthy, who it doesn't exhibit any of these, you know, symptoms of the people that I selected, like literally drew like magnets. Um, she, she's now in the picture very recently. Um, just when I was like, well, what if this is as good as it gets? This is pretty fucking great. And it really is. It, it's really, really pretty fucking great. Now you threw out the FBI thing. We didn't cover that. And I, can you, can you kind of briefly touch on that and what that well, was? About? That, that was very fascinating because I was headhunted um, after I graduated Columbia with really also cum laude. And um, I spoke Russian fluently. Um, my degree was in psychology. 
And I had been applying to jobs as a um, therapist, straight out of like a rookie, a green therapist looking for a first job after grad school. And I applied to a bunch of different places and there were some federal um, places and state run places that I had applied to, to be a counselor. And I got an arbitrary email, like, you know, we came across your name in an application and we thought you would be a good candidate to join the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Holy shit. Like, if you're interested, you know, please reach out to recruiter such and such. And I about fell out of my chair. I was like, what? So they were like, they were probably watching you and, and, and following you. Probably. Yeah. Um, for a while before they extended the invitation. Mm-hmm. And they probably vetted it to everyone in my life at that point before they extended the invitation or anyone that was close. Um, but I guess that, you know, my, my family and whatever shenanigans, nothing was serious enough to dis- discount me from being a candidate. And I was invited to become a candidate and they sent me the book because they're actually, the testing was very, very rigorous. Um, they wanted they wanted you to have a basic understanding, so more than a basic understanding of mathematics and sciences, um, which I sucked at math. So I got myself a tutor. Mm-hmm. Um, though there were never going to be any challenges with like the the liberal arts and the literature part, the reading comprehension part, the vocabulary part, which was more extensive than our preparation for SATs or GREs, by the way, which surprised the hell out of me. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I had my flashcards and I had a tutor for math and I started jogging. So I was like, I'm not in any physical shape. Um, I, you know, I've, I've always been in decent physical shape, but I wasn't in special agent physical shape at all. Mm-hmm. And I was, that was the part I was most afraid of was like, I'm not going to pass this grueling physical part, which is part three of their four step process. Or at least it was then I was 25 years old. So that was 18 years ago, almost 18 years ago. Um, and I got through the math and the testing and the science and the testing. And I got through part two of the testing, which was the personal interview where they, you know, ask you really, really, really uncomfortable questions. Um, can you give an example of one? Uh, what would you do if your mother was stealing? If your federal. mother was what? If your mother was stealing from the federal government. Oh, okay. This wasn't a polygraph as of yet. Mm-hmm. It was. It was. They It was. They were very morally compelling dilemmas mm-hmm. they presented you with. Like, are you going to break? And and are you going to lie to us about it? Because mm-hmm. she's going to rat out their mother to the federal government. Mm-hmm. And what's is there actually a right fucking answer? Um, and I didn't even know that. That wasn't even described in the protocols. Like they never said we're going to do this as part of, but they said you have an interview, mm-hmm. but they didn't, they didn't say that it was going to be like a Kierkegaard meets fucking Nietzsche meets like existential philosophy and moral code type stuff. Are you going to sell out your family for the federal government? Mm-hmm. And are you going to pretend to, or are you not going to pretend to? A lot of it was an interpretation of those kinds of things. Like what if your partner, your husband, your wife, um, So they wanted, I guess they were looking for unfounding loyalty, irrespective Mm -hmm. of who it is in your life. If they're committing some serious crime, are you going to turn on them? Mm -hmm. And it was just that something around that basis reinterpreted in 10 different scenarios. So it's like you walk out of there and your armpits are soaked. Like your shirt is stuck to your back and you're glad you have a suit jacket because they can't see it. That your Mm -hmm. shirt literally like you can see through the shirt, see your bra is wet your underwear are wet, like your, your sweat through. That's what I remember. Cause I walked out of there and it was springtime and it was in city hall in Manhattan. And I, I, I couldn't take off my jacket. So I rode home on the train with this jacket on the whole time because it was soaking wet and I would have been deeply embarrassed. How did you respond to that request? That question? Do you remember? Um, I remember saying, I remember saying in each and every instance that this would be an impossibly difficult decision to make. And I would need to, I would, I think I would be able to give you a more concrete, specific answer if I was in the situation. Okay. Like I found some interpretation of it's very hard to, and I, they liked that. Mm-hmm. It 
it's very hard to predict what you will do in a situation. And I think it's silly to try. Yeah. Like that was what I kept trying to say. Like, you're, you're asking me this. I don't believe that you're expecting me to give you an actual answer. Mm -hmm. Because how could I know if I, if I, what, I don't know how I would react if I found my mother with, you know, an arsenal of guns. I, I don't. Yeah. So, um, I out, I outwitted the situation and I think that they wanted to see if you were capable of doing something like that, because if they're going to send you to Russia, which is probably what they wanted me for, mm -hmm. um, I would have had to survive situations like that pressure, that tension, that hot seat every day. Mm -hmm. I got through that. Um, and then, so you come in and they bring you in with 10 other or 15 other candidates that had gotten to part three. And part three was essentially um, like, a, it was like a multiple choice questionnaire about your drug use. And, you know, the fine print in, in the application process was if you have ever smoked marijuana more than five times, if you have ever done cocaine more than two times, if you have ever done an illicit substance that's a hallucinogenic like LSD or psilocybin, you cannot work for the federal government. I mean, we all saw it. Mm -hmm. It was there. Um, I didn't think anything of it at all. Mm -hmm. I just continued along with the application process. I was like, yeah, come on, really? They don't mm -hmm. mean that. Especially the pot five times, come on. Yeah, yeah. Like we're, we're talking about graduate students, people who have graduated from universities that have a specific skill that you're interested in. You don't think they've gone to five frat parties? Mm -hmm. um, and then this guy comes in and really, Brian, it was like from, it was like from a movie. It was like, it was, it was springtime in New York. He was wearing a light colored suit. It was pastel. He wasn't wearing a, a button up shirt. He was wearing a t-shirt and he had the mirrored polarized sunglasses that he, you know, when he, when we walk, he was standing there like a cop would with the st position, the stance, the body language, his legs were spread a little wide and his arms were crossed across his chest. Um, and the sunglasses were on his face as we were walking in to sit down. And then he lifted them off his face and put them up on his head mm -hmm. uh, and said, so, okay, congratulations. You got this far. We're going to give you a piece of paper. It's only got 10 questions on it. It's not hard, but after we do this, we're going to give you a polygraph. Mm -hmm. So whatever you answer on this, on this piece of paper here, if you're lying, you will have wasted our time. You will have wasted your time. And you will have tried to lie to the federal government of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And if you think you're going to play some trick on the polygraph, that's why I'm here to tell you that you're not. So we're giving you an opportunity to answer honestly. And this is this was all about drug use, illicit drug use. And like, I looked at the fucking paper and it was very much, you know, what, how many times have you smoked marijuana? Have you ever purchased illicit drugs? If so, which were they? And I, he's, he, and he said, he said, look, at this point, you haven't lied to us yet. So there's not going to be any hard feelings. You can choose up to get up. You can choose to walk out of this room. No one's going to use anything against you because you will not have tried to lie to us yet. Mm -hmm. But if you lie on that piece of paper and we spend our resources on a polygraph test, then it's not good. It's not going to be good for you. And like ah, the, the tension in the room, the tension in the room, look at this paper. I don't know, like three minutes go by. You hear the clock. The clock is loud. It's on the wall behind the guy with the light colored suit and the mirrored glasses on his head. And the clock is tick, 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 tick. And it feels like a fucking eternity that this clock is ticking. And I can't even make myself write my name down on, on this paper because I understand the magnitude of now I'm actively lying and there's a man telling me, don't lie. It will fuck up your career. Do not lie. Like we're giving you an out. If you want an out, you should take it. 
tick, 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 tick. Like my family, everyone's going to be so disappointed. Elizabeth was dreaming of this. She was like, oh my God, my, my girlfriend's going to be an FBI agent. Star, uh, like Starling, Silence of the Lambs, every <laughs> fantasized thing is like all of these thoughts are happening and I'm, and I'm seeing this, this fantasy just disappear. Mm-hmm. And I pull back my, I, I was the first person, I pulled back my chair. I did not put my name on the piece of paper. And he actually nodded at me, like he, he nodded at me. It was, he didn't give me a, a, any shade. He didn't give me any dirty looks. He was like, okay, all right. Well, maybe if it's a year's thing, like if, if, if you didn't smoke more than five times, but it was like a year ago, come back next year, come back next year. Mm-hmm. Cause there was a lapse. Like you had to have not done it more than this many times within the last, like as of two years ago or three years ago, whatever it was, something specific goes, you know, maybe your chance isn't over yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I heard like, one ch- another chair screech out mm-hmm. and then another chair screech out and then another chair like four or five people got up and walked out of the room behind me and i was it was a beautiful it was a gorgeous spring day in new york city and i it was that was a feeling that i really felt that was i was completely present of mind for that moment of profound disappointment mm-hmm. um so do yeah. you feel that they almost wanted to see if you, they were testing your ability to lie if you were under pressure to under a polygraph that you could lie like truth? I think that that might have been one of the possibilities, but I also don't think that I could have passed the polygraph. Right. I mean, I, I'm a talented person, but I'm deep down, I'm a genuine person. Like, you know, my, my fudging and my finding little ways around things have been based in truths. Um, I, I don't think that I could have lied. I partied a lot. I went to Cal Arts. Like the numbers, there was no way to finagle. <laughs> <laughs> the years, the numbers, the, it's just there was no way. Yeah. Um, and for all I know, they had already known that. Yeah. And that was another thing, like they, they might very well have already known that if, if they had been watching me long enough to invite me yeah. to come this far, then they could have, they could have totally traced back. Like it was Brooklyn. It was the performing arts high school in New York city. There was, there were the sheep's meadow, central park, fucking mescaline and little, little sugar cubes. We were 17 years old. We were idiots. Um, but I did that. And, mm-hmm. and I just don't believe I could have passed the polygraph. Maybe now I might have. And then maybe now I'm old enough and I have the wherewithal. And I have the composure, possibly. If the FBI is listening or watching, uh, Lisa's ready to take the polygraph. <laughs> if they'd like to extend an invitation, I would probably politely decline at this point. Okay. Okay. But, Un- un- yeah. Understood. But you I was... Know- Maybe the CIA, though, because I think that that's super fascinating as well. More fascinating. <laughs> they, re- they recruit out of high school. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So, hey, listen, so uh, we're, we're, we're coming we're, up on a couple hours yeah. here. And yeah. um, so what I'm thinking, I, I, we haven't even touched psychology. And there's so much I want to, like, learn because I, 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 I you're not aware of this, but I almost left CalArts my first year to go to uh, San Francisco state and study psychology and become a psychologist. And I, I love psychology. And I think that there's definitely a parallel between acting and psychology. Oh, yes, there is. Very and much. I would love to explore that. I think we should do a second part. I, w- I would love to, I've had so much fun tonight. This, yeah. This it, I, I, it's so great. I, I am, I, I, I th- this was wonderful because I, I had no idea what was going to happen because I didn't know what, what you had done since you had left Cal Arts. So I'm, I'm thrilled about what I've learned. And I'm, I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to, to, to share this moment with you and reconnect. And um, let's definitely try to uh, uh, have another conversation and we'll, We'll focus on psychology because I, I'm I'm a fan of Eric Fromm. I love okay. his work. Okay. 
And um, so I, I would love to explore psychology. Also, my wife has a son, an older son, who's uh, 21 now, and he's he's on the spectrum. So um, the there's a lot to talk about. The best kind of people um, are on the spectrum, in, in my experience. Right. You know, Jerry Seinfeld said he believes he's on the spectrum. I completely could see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot. I think a lot of people are symptomatic. That's why. It, that's why it is a spectrum. I think you can have symptoms without having a full diagnosis to meet the criteria. Mm -hmm. But I. I mean, I have something called misophonia, which is very frequently occurring in autism, um, which is uh, a profound sensitivity to sounds. Um, so, Let's like say that one more time. You cut out a little a, bit. A, I didn't hear. a profound sensitivity to sounds, like that, it escalates my heart rate. I have to like. I can't be there. And they're very specific sounds like, like flip flops dragging on the floor, pick up your fucking feet. Um, it makes me crazy. <laughs> like, but yes, we should do a part B. Um, I, I had such a great time and, and I hope you and I can just connect and shoot the shit anyway. Yeah, of um, course. And I, I want you to meet my wife because I think she would love to meet you. And, and then secondly, she's also, she's, she's identifying as she feel that she has ADHD. So oh. she's exploring this and, and, and having this profound realization that a lot of the things that um, she's experienced in her life are related to her ADHD. And so she's in the process of being formally diagnosed, but, um, but yeah, there's so much to talk about and I would love to bring her in in an interview and you can actually, if you want, um, I think a couple episodes back, you'll see her. It's Rachel Snyder, and okay. and it's the title is ADHD. So oh, I'll I'll, t I'll check it out. So how do I see what we did today? How do I how do I look at it? So it's on it's us on YouTube, and it's under the Blind Man in Black, and then it's also on Apple Podcasts, Blind Man in Black. So there's those are the two options for either listening to it or watching it. Um, and uh, I'm going to post this probably this weekend. So, awesome. uh, so it'll be up and uh, I'll of course share the links with you. So you have it. Um, but before we go, I want to ask you one question and I'm sorry, I didn't, we can actually save this for next time. If, if, if you feel like you want to think about it first, but, and I did, and I apologize, I didn't mention this, but I, I asked the question, is there a moment in your life that you felt like that you love beyond your fears? That I, that I've loved beyond my fears. Yeah. And you can save it for next time. You don't have to answer yeah, now. I, just, I, I think I want to understand what you're actually asking me a little bit more clearly. Well, I'll, I'll tell I'll, I'll give you an example and we can, we can end it on that. Is it that um, for many years, because of, of, of uh, experiencing the loss of my eyesight and hearing, um, I, you know, I isolated myself and I, I, I also had very, uh, high standards about how I should live and um, conduct my life. And if I didn't achieve them, then I, I was, I was basically um, n not moving at all. And mm -hmm. so um, what happened was, is I, uh, uh, in 2017, I uh, had an experience where I lost um, my cat and my dog. I had a Bernese mountain dog and oh. And um, uh, there were all these things happening simultaneously. This happened within one month. And I, I had a cataract in my eyes and I was like, had these, all these realizations. I, I, I missed the opportunity to have a relationship. Um, this woman that uh, we were friends and then she confessed that she was in love with me. And then, um, and then I pushed her away and I said, I, you know, she wanted to have a family and I was like, no, like, I, you know, I, I did all these things. And so what happened in 2017, I, ha I had all these things happen. I lost my, my cat, my dog, um, and other things happened that I'm not, I don't remember what they were, but there were other things, all these things were, uh, compiled. And I had this realization that I need to live. I need to start living and, um, and, uh, and then I saw this, uh, it was funny. It was a meme but it was a Lakota prayer. And part of it said, I will love beyond my fears. And that really, um, I, I connected with that, 
with that. And I thought that's what I need to do is love beyond my fears. So when I had an opportunity to, and it was a bl literally a blind date that I met my wife, which is uh, oh wow, funny, but um, I, I had a moment where, um, what, you know, I, I, I opened myself up. Sorry, what? Poignant that it was a blind date. Yeah. And, and so I was like, uh, anyway, so I, I, I made a choice that I would love beyond my fears. And that's how um, I opened myself up to meet my wife and we immediately connected. I fell in love with her. And, um, and so we are actually going to do a podcast called loving beyond fear. And, and for whatever reason, it didn't materialize. We did like one episode and um, you know, life happened. And, um, and so a part of this podcast is loving beyond fears. And that's, that's the example that I use. Okay. I, I think I'm, I'm going to definitely think about that. Something is popping into my head, but I, it, it needs some more time to kind of develop. Okay. My, that's my response. Yes. That's awesome. So is there anything that you would like to share? Like is if somebody would like to contact you for therapy, uh, how do they connect with you? Oh, sure. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah. I didn't think of that, but uh, I'm on psychology today. Uh, Lisa okay. Shapiro. Um, I'm located. I work mostly virtually mm -hmm. uh, because that's just the way of the world today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have uh, a lot of experience across the board with all populations, not just LGBT or autism spectrum. But my big emphasis in recent years has been children, adolescents with autism spectrum and transgender folks with transgender concerns um, because that's just so prevalent. And I've been trained a lot in competency in that, in the, in that area. So Lisa Shapiro, Psychology Today, uh, easy to find. And um, I almost have a waiting list now. So if you do wanna connect with me, you should do it quickly. Um, therapists are in very high demand. I know betterhelp.com is, is really, I notice I, I'm hearing that everywhere. Yeah, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate in so far as that I don't have to work for anyone. Yeah. Um, I, it's, my practice is called Bloom Counseling and Thera Psychotherapy. Okay. I, I, I haven't gone out of my way to advertise other than to put my name and my skill set on psychology today. And I, I am my own, it's my own little business. I don't, I don't need to work for anyone else, which is pretty fantastic. And I'm proud now, of that. Will you send me the link because I want to include it in the show description? Like to, today? Yeah. My, my link? Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Send me the link so that I'll, I'll everybody who's listening and, and watching, you can find how to reach Lisa through the show description. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Brian. Yes, I will do that. All right. Lisa, All right. I, I am, I'm profoundly honored to that we've um, reconnected and I love you and appreciate I you. I love you too. And I had such a wonderful time and I'm so glad you reached out. I'm honored that you asked me and Thank I'm so you. glad I said yes. So this was wonderful, really. It was, this was soulful. Um, and, and I feel fulfilled in a, in a big way that I haven't felt in a long time. So thank you. The feeling is very, very mutual. And so let's, let's do this again. We'll focus on psychology because I love it. And I, I want to go deep into that. And I feel like there's just so much to talk about and I want to continue this discussion. So okay. I it would be my pleasure. Thank you. All right, everybody. This was The Blind Man in Black. I am your host, Brian Snyder. You're here with psychotherapist Lisa Shapiro, and you can find her on Psychology Today. And uh, like I mentioned, you can find the information in the show description uh, as to how to connect with Lisa if you're interested in uh, therapy. Uh, Lisa, I love you. Have a lovely evening, and let's talk soon. Uh, Thank you, and Brian. Good night. I love you, too. Have a great right. night. You okay. as well. We're going to have an awkward ending now, uh, as always. So, so uh, <laughs> all right. You take care. Stay okay. Yes. Bye. See you soon. Stay, stay healthy and safe. You too. You Thank too. you.